What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we'll be taking a look at Master of Magic, the recreation thereof. I was not around playing video games when the first one came out, alright? I'm gonna be honest with you, that was back in 1994. And at the time, I was a very small child, like seven or eight years old. I did, however, play tons of Lords of the Realm and lots of Lords of Magic. And so anyways, Master of Magic, it's been picked up by Slytherin, and they are doing a recreation of the 1994 cult classic 4X strategy game, where you are basically trying to be the most powerful wizard on the map. Uh, games like Age of Wonders, they were inspired by this game, and I'm happy to say that I've played this game for about three hours now, and I think it's solid as long as you understand that this is a very simple 4X game along the lines of probably not even complicated as something like Civ V. Uh, this is a very simple kind of entry-level 4X game that has some great artwork, it has some really good UI design, everything makes sense. And so in all honesty, I actually think this would make a really good first 4X game for a lot of people if they feel like the entire genre is kind of intimidating. So we're going to dive on in today, we're going to play for about 25-30 minutes, see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or otherwise pass on. Along the way, I'll give you some of my observations, some of the things I do and don't like about the game after my two or three hours with it. The game is available for purchase at the time this video goes live, so you can find that link down below. And then, of course, links to all of my various social media. Discord, which I ping when I go live, on Twitch, and all that stuff is down there. Let's play a new game, shall we? Uh, so at the beginning of the game, I have customized a little bit. And so what I've done is I've taken normal difficulty and I have fiddled with the world size. That's pretty much it, but there are a number of things that you can fiddle with here in the flip down menus that allow you to customize uh, your beginning experience. One thing that I did want to do is I wanted to eliminate or at least lower the amount of starting... I wanted to get rid of the amount of starting villages that are neutral. So there's like city states in this game, but they're really, really, really overpopulated. And so like, I've been playing for three hours and believe me when I say, uh, I'm not being facetious here. I have never been able to use a settler because a settler can only deploy uh, five tiles away from the nearest city. And the map is so chock-a-block in my experience with neutral city states that I've never been able to deploy a settler. I just use them as scouts now. And so anyways, I was going to try to turn that down, but I guess you can't. You can change their AI, but it looks like you can't actually, like, lower the amount of them. So that's a little bit of a bummer. But let's dive on in. We've got to pick our wizard. Now, every wizard is associated with different types of magic. So you've got everybody from Merlin here. You've got Jafar. Uh, you've got Kali. Uh, you've got Lelok. There's a bunch of wizards here. And they all have different schools of magic that they play around with. And so, for example, uh, Merlin is all about... I think sorcery, and I think he's all- nature and life magic, apparently. Fair enough. If you go with Raven, he's all about sorcery and nature magic. Some characters will start out with only one school of specialization. That means that they start out way more powerful than a lot of the other wizards, but they have a lot less, uh, I guess, variety to play around with because different schools have different things going for them. Uh, so, for example, like, nature magic tends to have a lot of heals and things of that nature. Uh, sorcery tends to have a lot of, like, confusion and shields and conjury, things like that. And so you will get to learn and know the various spell schools as you play the game more and more. Uh, the art right here is absolutely fantastic, like, utterly gorgeous art that they've allowed you to pick from here. Just really, really good looking stuff. Like I found myself just kind of staring at it while I was learning the game. We'll go with something simple for right now. We will start out with Merlin. And then from there, uh, we get to pick our starting spells. And so Merlin, uh, in our life tree, we can pick from a number of different things. I'm gonna go with, let's call it, let's call it Bless, let's call it Starfires. Let's go with healing, and let's go with, I think maybe, Guardian Spirit sounds all right. Let's do that one. Uh, for nature magic, I'm going to keep Wall of Stone. I'm going to take Giant Strength. I'm going to take Stone Skin, and then I'm probably going to take Sprites or War Bears. Let's go with War Bears. What's more awesome than being able to summon a couple of a boo boo like fuzzy friends to maul and destroy our enemies? Now that we've done that, we get to pick an army that we want to play as. There are Mirren races and there are Arcanian races. Uh, Mirren wizards are the only ones that can pick the Mirren races. 
in case you were wondering. We did not pick a Marin general, so we can't take a Marin race. However, there are Barbarians, Gnolls, Halflings. There's a lot of choices here. From what I've played so far, I've played the Barbarians, I've played the Gnolls, I've played the Hymen. They all seem kind of similar, in all honesty. Like, they have similar tracks. But we'll just keep it simple for the moment, and we'll go with... Oh, I don't know. Let's go with... Orcs. That sounds great to me. I like orcs. Orcs are rad. They get wyvern riders, which sounds rad as hell. So we'll probably do that. Uh, but anyways, we get to pick a banner now too. This was my first complaint about the game, is that the banners don't really like match up with the armies. So like all these banners right here are perfectly fine for like halflings, high men, high elves, nomads. They're fine. Uh, but I was hoping that when you picked an army, they would have different flags that kind of match up with the technology tree or match up with sort of the background of the race that you're playing. So like primitive races would like the barbarians and the orcs and the lizard men and the gnolls, they would have kind of flags that were like furry and tattered and sort of looked like they were made out of leather and whatnot. So thematically, the flags that you pick for your faction don't really match up. I guess comparatively, that's kind of like a small complaint in the greater context of the game, but I still wish it was kind of a thing. We'll just go with the purple flag flag for right now on our orcs and we will begin our run we are merlin of the orc clans all right welcome to the game uh we've got largut which is our capital i like largut it's a good place nobody judges you for having a beer belly and we are right here on the coast which means we should get some decent bonuses uh we're not making much money right now which kind of sucks but let me run you through the ui real fast so that you understand how things work uh, normally, I'd prefer not to spend 10 minutes talking about the UI, but with a game like this, it's kind of unavoidable. Uh, we've got our money. Use that to buy stuff. You've got magic. Use that to cast stuff. You've got food. Use that to feed stuff. And you've got your fame, which you use to attract stuff, like events. Uh, we can research spells. We can cast rituals from right here. We've got our wizard's info panel. We've got our city info panel. We've got our armies. We've got our magic panel, which is actually important because it matters. You can actually click and adjust these right here to determine how much mana you produce per turn, how much research you produce per turn, how fast you cast spells, stuff like that. Uh, for right now, I'm going to try to get like a bumper crop, I think of mana going. I'd like to have a big stack of mana. In this menu, you can also summon your units back to the capital using your summoning circle, and you can also turn gold into mana, and I think later on you can also convert mana into gold, if I remember correctly. But it is kind of, you gotta wait for that to happen. Aside from that, we have the diplomacy menu. Diplomacy in this game is fairly simple. It's nothing to write home about, and that's pretty much it. For the moment, we need to pick a research. And that is to say, a spell, because it's called Master of Magic. So the guy that learns all the spells is the best! Uh, let's go ahead and we will research, I don't really care, none of these are super important to me. We will research Holy Armour, I guess. And then from there, uh, we've got armies inside the capital that we could play around with. We've got some orcish swordsmen, and so we'll kind of get them meandering around trying to scout the map for a little bit. We also have a settler over here that we will also use as a scout in this direction, hopefully being able to start a new city. Because as you can see, we've got a gold production problem, and I need to get on top of that. Inside of our city, there's two different panels you can look at. This is the general panel with your taxes and like your general overview. But this panel right here, I wish came up by default and just kept the old UI. Uh, because you can actually watch your city grow, and there's little villagers that walk around and do stuff. And this is so much more of just like, to me, an interesting panel than this right here for building and I don't know I guess it's just kind of like a flavor thing but I wish I could have this open while also being able to manage and build my settlement I like it so much better but for now inside your city the stuff you need to be aware of is your citizens so we have four citizens as your city grows it gets more citizens you can apply them to two different tasks either farming or working Farming makes it so that you generate more food. Working makes it so that you poop more hammers, so that you can build buildings faster. And then rebels are what happens if your unrest gets too high in comparison to your population. Rebels don't do anything, man. They just sit around all day watching Netflix. Damn them. And so anyways, they deprive you of production. Over here we have coal inside of our territory, as you can see from... Where's the coal at? I don't actually see the coal inside our domain, but I assume it's there. We've also got Nightshade, apparently. Uh, these will give you different bonuses to different buildings and stuff, but for right now, not immediately important. What I'd like to do, because we have really bad money, is I want to build a marketplace first, and that's going to take 20 turns, and then after that I want to build a shrine. So we'll get on that first, and then we'll probably try to expand out our army from there? 
I may actually cancel some of those so that I can build an army more rapidly, but like for now, it's fine. Let's keep moving our army off in this direction, trying to find a spot to settle. I would think. Uh, we have to be five tiles away from our town before we can settle anything. I'm going to keep the army kind of close with these guys. Uh, apparently there is a neutral city over here that is filled with nomads, but we don't really know anything about that. So, let's get close and see if we can scout them. And it looks like they have three groupings of nomad swordsmen. That's not great. Not amazing having a hostile, kind of unpredictable force so close. Uh, Master, I come bearing gifts. This event always happens at the beginning of your game. Basically, this little guy, my frog that hangs out with me, my little toad frog, uh, he's offering me a free unit. You can swap it out for gold if you go to choices or whatever, and it'll expand this menu upwards. But I'm just going to take the spirit because it's a combat unit. It helps. And also, we can use the spirit uh, to... You see these spots that have stars above them? Those are points of power. If you conquer them, you can take a spirit and put it on top of that tile, and it will add that power to your overall mastery of magic, which is important because the limits on what you can do with your meters inside this menu... Uh, they are set by what your power rating is. So taking over that and getting an extra 12 power would actually be really, really huge for us because it would allow me to tip up all these meters, basically. It would redistribute 12 points amongst all three of these beakers. And so it would make me comparatively much more powerful than I am right now when it comes to researching, generating mana, and generally just doing activities. Uh, you guys come down here and meet up with my main army. I'll end a turn right there, and I'm going to kind of scout down this way and see if there's a spot where I can settle. This army, come over to the forest. You meet up with them. Uh, we'll talk about combat in just a minute and what it entails. Uh, combat in this game is actually really, really simple, but it's more complicated than it looks is the best way I know how to describe it. Maybe I can settle them down here. I could. I was able to settle them down there. I got to deploy my first settlement, dude. I'm so happy about that. Normally, I don't get to settle anything. If you want to know what the bonuses are that you're getting from the tiles inside your area of control, all you've got to do is turn on the examine menu and look around. Uh, very, very easy to figure out. That node right there may actually be open for conquering pretty soon. I'm going to keep scouting and just keeping guys around. I think that might be the coal that's counting for our city right there, but it's kind of hard to say. What bonuses did this place get? Oh, it's a camp right now. That's right. It takes like 10 turns to set up. Uh, let's continue to move around. We want to leave the spearmen on that tile because chances are these guys are going to attack it. Uh, the neutral cities do not hang out and do nothing. They do actually attempt to like back cap you and stuff. Oh, Quiet Vale is over here. Is Quiet Vale conquerable? Quiet Vale is halflings, and they have three stacks of halfling swordsmen in there. Fair enough. Uh, we will just kind of... We're surrounded by things that really, really want to hurt us right now. This has got me feeling a little bit worried. I, I feel like a sword blade may be coming. Uh, we are actually super boxed in right now. This is not great. In fact, I'm surprised I even got to deploy Brassar. So the way that I see it is we're surrounded on all sides by fortified enemies that know what they're doing. And, and kind of have a lot of units. Uh, these guys by far have the largest army. They have like a seven stack inside their walls and they've got walls built and they're like a tier two society. Like these guys down here and these guys over here are probably the easiest targets to go after first in order to consolidate our our kingdom, but it's kind of hard to say. Your units in this game, they do level up. So for example, what you see right here is that my swordsmen have leveled up. That means they got another batch of resistance and they get one more melee attack roll. Uh, combat in this game... It's got things going on underneath the surface that may frustrate you if you aren't aware of them. And what I mean by that is, let me explain how combat works in this game. So with their stats, what you can see here is that there's kind of like a stat, a percentage, a number of swords. Like, what does that all mean? Uh, basically, what it means is that there are dice rolls in this game and the combat is semi-random. So your unit, we have six units. Each of these six units, when they attack an enemy, they will roll a dice four times because that's the amount of swords that they have. And the dice that they roll has a 30% chance of coming back positive. If it comes back positive, that's one damage dealt, basically. Uh, with these guys, chances are they'll probably roll a one or a two each time. That damage is applied to the enemy's health, but the enemy gets to roll their shields. So your shields will roll twice 
um, at 30%, and they will negate any damage. Basically, they'll cancel out a sword, effectively. And each of these units takes a turn facing off against the enemy. So these guys have a lot of units, but they don't have a lot of damage uh, and a lot of defense. So these guys are kind of like grist for the mill soldiers that are supposed to die in droves, basically. Uh, but as they level up, they get more swords, they get more shields, and they become much, much more competent in combat. If you don't understand what I just said, the game does have a video you can watch that's nested inside the game itself that will allow you to see that process happening in real time. And in fact, it's quite a good video. After watching it for like an eighth of a second, I basically figured out pretty quickly how the combat works. But up until then, I was very confused. I was like, why is my four sword, 15 HP unit losing to their two sword, you know, two guard, three HP unit? Uh, it was just bad dice rolls, and after I investigated a little bit, it made a lot more sense. What we need to do now is we kind of just need to bypass turns over here until we get some tech rolling. You guys just kind of guard and hang out and make sure this doesn't get taken over. Uh, Broussar should be a city now, right? Nope, not quite there yet. But we did get a Barbarian Bowman will join us for 60 bucks. Oh, you're kind of terrible. You're not great, and 60 bucks is pricey, but I need units, so I'm going to hire you because I'm worried for my future if I don't get an army up and going in between all these factions that want me dead. Really what I'm worried about here is that if I extend myself to attack any of these factions, this guy is going to swoop in and back cap my capital, and I'm going to lose the game. Uh, if your capital dies, you lose the game. So anyways, that's kind of what I'm concerned about right now. I am going to get rid of the shrine, and because we have a cash surplus, we have room for two more units. Uh, Non-combatant units, they build roads and can also aid you in toppling enemy walls. Let's go ahead, and let's get two batches of swordsmen going. I'd like to have an army. That's just the way that I feel about it. Having an army sounds super rad. These guys are also training while they chillax, and so they're getting stronger, so that's really, really nice. I don't know if that was him that leveled up. Did he get a second sword? Well, anyways, it says he got more resistance and stuff. I don't know. Maybe I just forgot to click it. In this city, what we need to do is we need to kind of get them up and running as well. We've got some extra food coming in from them, but based on their bonuses, it looks like they're just on a shoreline, so their income is much higher and their max population is up. We need to get them going with some of the basics. And so I think a good place to start is going to be a builder's hall and then maybe a granary after we get that done, possibly. Yeah, that'll that'll probably be a good place to start. But these guys are probably going to get conquered and reconquered a couple times before we can do much. Let's go ahead and continue to bolster up our army over here. So our second unit is now done. That's good. Uh, we don't have any rebels yet, weirdly enough. And I expected us to have rebels by now. So we may be able to cheese out and not buy certain things. Let's get the farmer's market, I suppose. It's going to take 15 turns to knock that out, but it'll fix a lot of our food supplies. We also have a lot of forest tiles in here, so a, saw a sawmill might be a good idea. Uh, you guys... I honestly think that we are going to have to go after these guys over here. I don't think we have too many options on that front. Like, I think it's going to have to happen. We need to knock somebody off the board sooner rather than later. What's inside this cave right here? Anything good? Uh, it looks like it's just a bear. I will show you what combat works like, but the auto-resolve in this game is actually quite good. And the reason it is quite good, and this is a feature I'd love to see in every game with auto-resolve. Uh, the reason it is quite good is because it subdivides outcomes. So it looks at your army, it looks at the enemy's army, and it says to itself, you have a 30% chance of winning with no losses, you have a 70% chance of winning with very minimal losses, and then you have no chance of moderate, heavy, or losing. Uh, it's really, really fantastic, and the auto-resolve in this game actually sticks to that. It rolls a dice between these two right here, and then it just distributes damage and casualties based on what you get, uh, which I feel is a very, very fair thing, because this makes the player incredibly in tune with what is going to happen 
when they decide to auto resolve. Like it gives you information, it keeps you informed. That's good. I hope other games consider adding that. Uh, their bears are gonna charge up on us. I'm gonna move the army forward. Huh. The orc swordsman and the barbarian swordsman look the same. That's kind of a bummer. I don't know. I was hoping they'd be a little, at least a little bit like green or like red or something. That kind of bums me out. I do have a lot of mana. Uh, technically, I could cast starfires on the bears, uh, but they're not a valid target right now. We'd have to wait for them to get closer. So I'm just going to end my turn. I'm going to let them move up on us. It looks like they're angling for this unit right here. So I'm going to move the archers back. Oh, he's still got to get an attack off. Bummer. All right, so with you, what I want you to do is we're going to cast Starfires over here on you. Oh, Starfires won't hit them. What does Starfires hit? Uh, stars fall and pierce the enemies of life. Only effective versus chaos and death creatures. Well, that's a bummerowski. All right, well, then I'll give you Stone Skin so that you have less of a chance of getting whomped by the great and powerful war bear. Uh, you guys go ahead and feather him a little bit. 30% chance of dealing damage. Not altogether that great, but we did deal damage nonetheless. And so they've got total 16 HP. Wow, these guys can hit like a truck if they want to. Uh, let's go ahead and pull them back. You guys go in and attack. Uh, they got a decent attack roll right there, actually. Not too bad, all things considered. We'll move that part of the army back up. They are attacking my unit down here, which was apparently very successful, but they still lost a unit along the way. Uh, we didn't deal any damage right there, unfortunately. But we are knocking these guys off. And so there you go. The bears have been finished. Uh, we didn't take any casualties right there. And it looks like we got two mana from exploring that place. That's after we spent mana on a spell. So we would have got more, but we spent a spell. And then we got XP for our swordsmen. We got XP for our bowmen. Everybody pretty much leveled up a little bit. Not bad. Uh, we're going to leave them over here and let them recuperate for a minute until they are back up and ready to fight. This will also give them a chance to train a little bit, I hope. Inside our city, we've got two turns going right there. And down here, I'd like to get them another unit, in all honesty. Even if I have to build it up here and have them walk down to there, it just feels like a good idea to me. Like, I know we're going to get hit pretty soon. Enemy in this game can be kind of vicious. I'm going to scout both these tiles and see what they are before too long. Uh, that tile right there, it is a hidden beast lair where we will fight two fire elementals. And it'll be a little bit of a rough fight. It's not going to be easy. Uh, it says that we're going to take, we have a 20% chance of taking like moderate losses, which is like half of our troop. Uh, let's go ahead and we won't engage on that one. What does this one have right here? Uh, it's just one phantom warrior, so we can knock him off with auto resolve real fast and just kind of see what we get back. Apparently the AI decided to cast a spell. I do wish there was an option to tell your familiar that you're not allowed to cast spells. In fact, let me open this back up and make sure that I didn't miss that. Still, we got a little bit of cash and we cleared out an enemy place where enemy armies can spawn from. So that's good. Uh, ah, allow your familiar to use mana to increase your chance of victory. Gotcha. Fair enough. Uh, that was my fault then for not paying attention to the full cadre of options available. Uh, let's see what this little point of power has for us down here. Uh, salutations to you. I am Jafar, and I hope the fates have brought us here with good fortune in mind. Remember that today we may be friends. No one knows what tomorrow may bring. Okay. So we met a faction. Did he conquer somebody near me? How did we meet him? Oh, he did. He conquered that nomad faction over there. On one hand, that's a good thing. On another hand, that's a bad thing. Uh, so over here, we've got a pretty brutal fight against some phantom warriors. So we're going to need to fortify ourselves a bit before that's an option. What that means is that now that he's boxed us in on that side, I need to take these guys out down here in Quiet Vale before too long. Uh, otherwise, things are going to get bad before they get better. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he's going to start angling for my territory now. Oh, these guys are kind of building up. That's sort of a bummer, dude. We're like surrounded on all sides by pretty hostile forces. 
It does look like my archer leveled up, though. Did she get another sword? Ooh, she did. That increases her chance of dealing damage. Nice. Okay, well, before we get completely and totally boxed in, let's... We'll finish our construction over here, and then we'll try to put a few more military units down the pipe. This great hero would like to join you in exchange for 100 bucks. He's not bad. He's not terrible. His weapon is naturally enchanted, too, which means that he can hit things that have weapon immunity. He's got constitution, which means every time he levels up, he guarantee gets HP. He can cross mountains and hills easier. Yeah, I'll take him. Why not? He's a dwarf, too. What's not to love about dwarves? Uh, you come down this way, and we will meet on back up. And now my troop stack has gotten a little bit better. We'll decide who we want to bushwhack next. Oi, what are you doing in my territory, bro? You should leave. I don't like you being in my territory. I hate everything about that. You're not allowed. That's my borders right there, bro. Diplomatically, you gotta ask to do that. You're not allowed to do that. I'm gonna come keep an eye on him, maybe. Yeah, I was gonna say, he's being a little funky right now. I don't like what he's playing around with. With my hero, do I have a better chance over here? No, it still says that I get flatly stomped. So each of those guys die pretty easy, but there's six of them in each stack. They've got really good attack, too. Wow, their attack is actually pretty crazy. Okay. Man, did you just take out... He's over here farming my nodes, dude. I hate that. How is he conquering nodes with one batch of barbarian swordsmen? That was two fire elementals. In what world does one group of barbarian swordsmen take down two fire elementals? I get the feeling the AI cheats, bro. That's the feeling that I'm getting. And apparently their unit is now gone because they attacked that node right there, which actually softened it up for me. So I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to go for it hard. Yep. Let's do it. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you, Jafar, or whatever your name. Was that Jafar? I don't know who that was. Either way, I appreciate you, buddy. You just gained me seven power. I just have to keep my ghost alive. All right, you guys march forward. But yeah, let me give you some of my thoughts about the game from the couple hours that I've spent. We're kind of getting towards the end of the video anyways, so I'll kind of uh, summarize everything for you. So Master of Magic is kind of a tough summary, just like when we covered uh, Knights of Honor 2 last week. Just because I never checked out the original, never played the original. So if you're looking for a point-by-point -point comparison here, I can't supply you with that sort of commentary. But I can attack it as a game that like, I'm playing for the first time by comparison to its peers. And on a gameplay front, I'll say that the game is obviously trying to stay faithful to something. As while I was playing it, it definitely has the vibe of being a retro 4X game. Uh, most aspects of the game function perfectly fine. The UI is great. I felt like it was really easy to find things. It was easy to navigate if I didn't know how something worked. Uh, there's lots of tutorials and UIs and things you can open up for it to explain how it works. Uh, the learning process was very, very rapid for this 4X game. Uh, everything is pleasantly in a logical place. Uh, the artwork is utterly stunning for a lot of the wizards and a lot of the things like that, but it doesn't quite translate over into a personality for the game as a whole. Uh, the game seems to suffer a little bit from, like, a lack of atmosphere and theming. Like, there's no voiceovers of, like, wizards taunting each other. Uh, there's no unit confirmations. There's not really any of that extra confetti that makes a game feel immersive, and so it was a little bit tougher for me to get into it because of that. That said, all the components seem to work throughout the game. And, like, once you understand how the combat works at a low level and how the dice rolls function, I think you'll be off to the races pretty quickly. Uh, it's strangely enough, like, the only way that I really know how to describe it is, like, it's a customizable, simple game from what I've seen so far. Like, there's lots of stuff you can do with your wizard when it comes to, like, what order do you want to build your town? Like, what order do you want to learn your spells? What spell schools do you want to specialize in? Uh, but, like, diplomacy really isn't anything to write home about. It's mostly, like, research treaties, alliances, stuff like that, but it's not super in-depth. Uh, this game, I think, is a lot more about spells and monsters kind of crashing into one another. 
and I think on the overworld map, like most of your time is going to be spent fiddling with village outputs, moving armies around, and generally dungeon diving to make some cash. Uh, things I would have liked to have seen, like I would have liked to have seen some interior battlefields, like when you fight in like a cave, like a monster lair, you're not like actually in a cave, you just kind of like fight out in front of it, and they put like a little, a little cave model, like slightly off screen that's back there. Like I would have liked to have actually fought in a cave with like the gloomy lighting and, you know, torches illuminating things and stuff like that. Um... Combat is, I think, actually where the game feels the most outdated to me personally. Like, I, I don't think, I didn't play the original game, but it doesn't feel like the combat was touched up very much to fit modern standards. Like, but it does play pretty much how I remember games in the late 90s playing, so that's probably what they were going for. But I, still, I personally would have liked to have seen some better animations in combat for, like, the various, like, troops. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more life and personality put into the units. Uh, toggleable action camera, for example, when they slam into each other, you could see them like fighting and knocking each other around and then it zooms back out and you could just toggle that if you didn't want to see it. Uh, but still, I, I think that everything the game does that I've seen so far in about three hours is serviceable. It's not like a hugely complicated or in-depth game from what I've seen so far, but it is a game that works and I think that it could have used a little bit more frosting to really bring Master of Magic into the future and modernize it. Uh, the cake itself is actually proved properly and it's reasonably tasty. I think like the best way that I can put it is that like the game didn't blow my hair back, but also I wasn't disappointed and I wasn't bored either. Like, that's the best way that I can put it. So anyways, Master of Magic. Uh, this is the video that I've done on it. Hopefully if I fail to cover anything, the video will speak for itself and help you make up your mind whether or not you want to buy it. I don't think that this is going to be a game that's for everybody, but it does have that dollop of nostalgia in there, I guess, that did take me a little bit back to the, the late 90s when it came to strategy games like, you know, Lords of the Realm and uh, Lords of Magic and all those old games. So, my name is Flattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, we were taking a look at the new Master of Magic. Tomorrow we'll be looking at something else. Thank you for spending your time with me, and that's about all I've got. Bye, folks.